Hey guys, Andre from High Performance Academy here. Welcome along to another one of our webinars. And I also want to thank you for your patience. A few technical glitches getting our cameras working, but I think we're on top of it. Now today's webinar, we're going to be looking at uh, some options for creating a wet sump system that's going to be suitable for a high performance competition car. We'll talk all about the problems with lubrication systems once we actually get into our webinar. However, before we do jump into our webinar, I just wanted to talk about what has been going on around here for the last week. And if you did join us last week, you'll know that I was talking about the upgrades we're making to one of our FA20 engines. As with just about anything that comes to do with engines, it's taken a little bit longer than we'd hoped for and there were a few hurdles in the way. But I think just talking about these hurdles, because they are real hurdles that everyone's going to face with these sorts of jobs, is probably going to be beneficial to everyone out there. Uh, so first of all, let's just get our sump out of the way. That's going to come in a little bit later. And uh, what we'll do is we'll just jump to our overhead shot here. And uh, this is one of our factory Subaru FA20 rods. Pretty tiny little thing, I think this one actually is bent, so this is why we pulled the engine apart. Probably a little bit hard to tell, but uh, there's actually a bend through the beam of this rod, and uh, we've bent two rods on two separate motors, so we know that that's definitely a weak link. And uh, beside this, let's get them around the, the same way, uh, we've got our Brian Crower H-beam rod. So uh, these were actually purchased for our other engine build, which is a little bit more of an elaborate build. We're going the whole hog with the new engine with forged pistons. We've also closed deck the block. Uh, a host of other upgrades. However, while we're waiting to actually film the worked example for our engine building course using that engine, we really wanted to get this other engine up and running. Seemed like a good idea to swap in a set of these H-beam rods, seeing as that was our weak link, despite the fact the factory kept factory pistons are high compression 12.5 to 1 and they are cast we so far haven't actually damaged a piston even though we are running sort of 8 to 9 psi of boost one of the advantages that we are using to keep this engine alive is of course we're running on E85 fuel so the first thought was we're just going to sit in these uh, swap in these H beam rods and everything's going to be fine what uh, we quickly found out however is that uh, the factory FA20 rod is actually tapered towards the the top of the uh, the rod. Uh, it's smaller so that it'll fit into the tapered pin boss on the piston. So of course our H-beam BC rods wouldn't fit. So the first task was to have our machinist narrow these down. Uh, I think we'll try this over the under the overhead shot here. So hopefully you'll be able to see both of those rods side by side. Uh, so that gives us basically a pin boss that matches the factory rod. It's going to make everything fit. Now, I did point this out last week, but I'll just mention again for those of you out there wondering, yes, of course, this is going to have some effect on the strength of the BC rod. Narrowing that down reduces the load-bearing surface there. It's going to reduce the strength of the rod. But we've got a rod there that's way overkill for the fact we've still got a factory cast piston. We're really not going to be expecting much more power from this engine than what we were previously running. So I'm still 100% comfortable with that. Now, the next problem we found, though, was that... Uh, when we did a dummy assemble, assembly with everything and we checked the bearing clearances, uh, we found that our bearing clearances were a little bit tighter than what I wanted to run. Now on the FA20 engine there's actually a fairly broad spread uh, in factory tolerance. The lower limit is about 0 0.9 thou, uh, so just under 1 thou oil clearance and the upper limit for that is 2.2 thou. Now, we started out with our new bearings in those rods and our bearing clearance came in at about 1.1 thou. So we were actually within the factory tolerance. And if that was a stock naturally aspirated engine, uh, I would have probably been reasonably happy with that. The fact that we are running a turbo on the engine, we're pushing it pretty hard and we also want to run a heavier weight oil. 1.1 thou is just a touch on the tight side and I wanted it to be somewhere closer to 2 thou. Now, traditionally, this is a little bit tricky and there, this is a question we quite often get asked asked is how do we actually make adjustments to our bearing clearance and the answer is that unfortunately it depends on the engine you're working with and what sort of adjustment you need to make. In the mainstream we're quite often going to be dealing with engines which use what's referred to as graded bearing shells. So this is kind of a factory way of blueprinting the oil clearances if you like. So those graded bearing shells vary very slightly in thickness and basically by mixing and matching the graded bearing shells we can get our clearance exactly
exactly where we want it. If we're dealing with factory components, this becomes really easy. Quite often, uh, there'll be a number, a grading number printed on the connecting rod, and there'll also be a matching grading number cast into the crankshaft. And we go through a grid in our workshop manual, and that'll basically tell us what grade bearing shelves to use. With the FA20, we don't have that option, unfortunately. They don't have uh, graded bearings like that. In the aftermarket, quite often, we will be able to purchase bearing shelves that are uh, one thou tighter, uh, sometimes often one thou looser, to give us a broad adjustment. Of course, that's not particularly accurate. Uh, so the usual technique, if everything was apart, is that we would have our machinist polish the additional clearance, being that it's only a small change we need to make, into the journal on the crankshaft itself. So that's not a difficult task for most engine machinists to perform, get our clearances right where we want them. In this case the block is still together with our crankshaft in there. I really don't want to go too much further with this and as I've mentioned it's only a very basic build just to get us up and running. Uh, so what we did do is check the uh, big end bore. So this is the bore diameter uh, of the, the um, Conrod and we compared that to our factory Conrods and what we found is uh, that they were quite a lot smaller so again like everything every specification in our engine there is an upper limit and a lower limit to our big end bore on our connecting rods uh, so what we did was we sent our rods back to our machinist and we had them uh, machine basically three quarters of a thou uh, or hone the big end bores about three quarters of a thou just done a dummy assembly about half an hour ago and now our clearances are bang on two thou or 1.9 thou, so right where we wanted them. So uh, just a little trick to keep in the back of your mind if you are building engines. There are a variety of ways of making small adjustments to our bearing clearances and uh, really the option that you're going to go through is just dependent on how far you need to adjust those clearances. Uh, a point I will make here is we don't want to end up honing our big end bore too far. We want to obviously stay within the tolerance limits that the factory dictate. The reason for this is uh, the big end bore on our connecting rod will provide a crush on our bearing shells and that's essential to make sure the bearing shells stay properly seated and there's no chance of those spinning in the big end bore of the connecting rod. So uh, that's just uh, something to keep in mind there. So that's our, uh, our Connecting rods there, our upgrade is underway. Uh, we've got one of our pistons there as well, but there's not a lot to really look at uh, on our pistons. The next thing I wanted to talk about here is our uh, turbo kit that we're going to be fitting onto our FD RX7. And again, I did touch on this briefly last week, although last week I was sitting in a car, really difficult to actually show you guys uh, the products that are here. So instead of a couple of pictures, this time I've actually got the Turbulon cast investment cast 347 stainless steel exhaust manifold that's going on our 13B. And uh, one of the aspects that I was talking about last week was the integration of the external wastegates and how the flow out of the exhaust or out of the engine itself uh, basically gets a nice easy path out into the wastegate and that's really essential in maintaining really good boost control. A couple of things I wanted to talk about as well this week is that on the underside of this manifold, or actually sorry, the top side of this manifold as it sits when it's installed, uh, we've got a couple of threaded bosses on each runner and this just makes it a little bit easier for us to add some additional inputs to our ECU. Uh, so the first thing we're going to be adding to this is a pair of K-type exhaust gas temperature thermocouples. Uh, so particularly with rotary engines, they are known for running very hot. Uh, we can use the EGT sensors to help us to some degree with our rotor-to-rotor -rotor, uh, fuel delivery and try and get those EGTs as even as we can. I will just mention here that the EGT sensor is kind of a roundabout way of, of giving us information about our air-fuel ratio and it certainly isn't uh, perfect. One of our other development cars we've got both individual cylinder exhaust gas temperature sensors as well as individual cylinder lambda and uh, what we do find is when we've got the individual cylinder lambda perfectly even across all four cylinders we actually still see some variation in our EGT and the reason for this is uh, there are a lot of uh, aspects that can affect the specific exhaust gas temperature value. One of them is the distance from in a piston engine, the exhaust valve. We want to make sure that that's the same for all of our EGT sensors. And we also want to make sure that uh, the sensor is protruding the same distance into the runner. Uh, so if we got all of that correct, we've got a much better chance of getting a 
getting our EGT values matched when our air fuel ratio is is matched. Now you might be thinking, well, if an individual cylinder or original individual rotor lambda is the better way to go, why don't we do that? It's a great question, but on the rotary engine, given that they do run very, very hot, uh, this is going to be a very harsh environment for our lambda sensors to live in, uh, whereas the EGT sensors are a little bit more hardy. Another tip I'll give you there as well is these EGT sensors come in a variety of different designs. Uh, they come in eighth inch diameter as well as quarter inch. The one I've got here is a quarter inch. Uh, with an exposed tip, the advantage is that that uh, junction is exposed to the exhaust gas flow, so it gives you a faster uh, change in temperature or measurement uh, can respond quicker is what I'm basically trying to say. Uh, however, again, just with my experience using these in harsh drag applications, uh, they don't last that well. And when they do fail, uh, you're likely to end up getting a small piece of that junction uh, go through your turbocharger. I personally haven't seen any damage from it in the failures I've had. However, it's def definitely not something you'd want to be trying to replicate. Uh, so this is an enclosed tip where that junction is encased so it's protected. Uh, this does mean that in my experience between the enclosed and the exposed tip they tend to read a little bit lower and they also tend to respond just a little bit more slowly. And this also brings me to another point just with regard to exhaust gas temperature measurement. Uh, one of the questions we quite often get in our webinars is what is a safe limit for our exhaust gas temperature? And the problem with this is the specific number is a guide, definitely uh, uh, you can take some guidance from what you're seeing, but there are so many things that will influence the specific or absolute number that you're seeing from your EGT sensor that it's not possible to say that, for example, uh, 985 degrees C is the absolute maximum, don't go above that. Uh, so, for example, the distance from the exhaust port, that will affect your exhaust gas temperature reading. Uh, likewise, if you run a very retarded ignition timing, that will tend to actually build more temperature in the exhaust port so uh, hence you of course get more EGT being measured. Uh, one of the things we can use these with though is to just help protect our turbocharger. Uh, we do find that depending on the material that the turbine housing and turbine wheel are made from, uh, running them for extended periods at uh, temperatures above about a thousand degrees C can result in failures so you do need to watch that. Uh, the other port that we've got on that particular exhaust manifold is going to be for exhaust manifold back pressure. Uh, so we've got four ports, obviously two of them for EGT, two of them for exhaust manifold back pressure. Uh, so we're going to be using those as inputs to our ECU. Uh, there's a variety of reasons we all a variety of advantages of measuring the exhaust back pressure. One of them is that it's a really good guide for how well your turbocharger is mapped to the engine, but we can actually integrate the uh, exhaust manifold back pressure signal as part of our main fuel calculation as well. And uh, the advantage if we do that is it can essentially automatically compensate for changes in barometric pressure or changes in altitude. So your tune should theoretically stay more consistent. Now the problem with getting a good signal from an exhaust manifold back pressure sensor or to an exhaust manifold back pressure sensor is that you do need to mount the sensor in a way that it's going to measure that pressure without getting damaged. So obviously fitting a pressure sensor directly to the exhaust manifold that's not going to work, it's going to be exposed to 900 plus degrees centigrade, uh, we don't want that, it's not going to last very long. So instead what we do is we remote mount the sensor, uh, here I've got a Honeywell uh, 150 PSI sensor and uh, we've got a couple of canisters, so I've got one of these for uh, each of our EMAP sensors, so these are from Full Function Engineering and basically these work as a uh, sort of a, a mechanical filter for that signal, because if you think about it, you're going to to end up getting some quite big pulses in that EMAP signal as the uh, the exhaust port on the rotary engine opens and closes and that doesn't really give us a signal that's particularly useful so uh, by filtering that we get a, a smoother signal that the ECU can actually utilise and this also helps protect the sensor from the full heat uh, of the exhaust manifold. Now this is going to be connected remotely by a section of uh, steel 
tube and that again helps get some of the heat out of the system and what we can end up doing is we'll mount this somewhere probably up on the firewall away from the exhaust manifold so we're going to have a run that might be three or four feet of the steel tube between the exhaust manifold and the uh, EMAP canister that gets rid of all of that heat and means that these sensors are going to lead a long and healthy life even if they are in a pretty harsh environment. Uh, right, so that covers our turbulent part. Pretty excited to get that project up and running, uh, but we probably are realistically still a little ways off. We're still waiting on some heat shielding from turbulent, and uh, we also have a pretty stacked schedule right now, so we need to fit everything into that. Uh, I also have been talking recently about the uh, cooling problems we've been having with our V8 Toyota 86 and I want to cover a couple of things that we've done here. We're hoping to get the car back to the track sometime next week and have a bit of a test to see how that's all working. So if we head across to my laptop screen, uh, please excuse the fact that at the moment none of the shrouding that we've put in here uh, has been painted. This is all a bit temporary at the moment. Uh, so this is a view from the front of the car and uh, we've got over here on the left obviously our radiator. Uh, what we've ended up doing is having a fabric to build a bit of a wall here and uh, the new oil cooler is mounted over here on the right hand side. Uh, so basically it separates the flow of air at the front of the car. Some will be going straight into the radiator and some more air will be ducted straight into our oil cooler. And for those who have been watching uh, for the last few weeks you'll probably remember that originally our oil cooler was actually mounted directly in front of the radiator. So uh, not great for cooling air flow into our radiator. So I've mounted that up and uh, just the, today I've been adding some more fittings so we've got some uh, speed flow AN fittings here that plumb uh, the oil cooler up into the dry sump system. Uh, so hoping that that's going to go some ways to fixing our cooling woes. There's also a couple of issues around how the expansion tank had been plumbed up uh, so in some in some discussions with PWR they recommended a couple of small changes that we make there so we'll try that first and foremost and uh, if that doesn't work we're probably going to end up ducting the radiator back out uh, the top of the uh, the hood or the horsepower and cooling capability so we should on paper be absolutely fine so we'll see how we get on there and the other problem we had with our Toyota 86 was the uh, diff we were massively over overheating the diff. So we've got a couple of things we're going through here. Uh, we have just purchased a Cusco uh, diff cover. Now we posted this actually up on our Instagram and we managed to get quite a bit of heat about it. Seems like just about anyone on the internet is a huge Gail Banks fan and they've spent a lot of time watching Gail Banks's uh, fairly extensive video se section uh, about aftermarket diff covers. And to be perfectly honest, I can't fault his logic. I, I really like the uh, analytical approach that Gail Banks has put into designing their own diff covers. So he raises a few issues, but let's go through those. So uh, we'll just go over into our overhead camera here. And uh, what we can see, it's all CNC machined here uh, and it's quite deep and it adds around about half a litre of additional capacity. And Gail Banks quite rightly points out that uh, without the uh, nice smooth rounded back shape that the factory differential cover has, you're likely to actually end up putting more heat into the oil as it's forced into the back of the cover. Uh, basically you're, you're, putting, you're working that oil a little bit harder. All good points and probably quite valid points. Uh, the part that people missed is that one of the reasons we're actually fitting this cover is not so much for the uh, additional capacity or the fins to help cool it. Uh, what we're doing is we're going to be using the uh, two fittings on it to adapt up to an external oil cooler. So we're going to actually be adding an external diff oil cooler. Uh, we've also added here, as you can see, a temperature sensor so that we're going to be able to monitor our diff temperature and actually see exactly what's happening. Uh, so while the diff cover on its own may not actually be a silver bullet in fixing uh, overheating problems with the factory differential, uh, by the time we've actually got an external pump and cooler fitted to this, uh, we're pretty confident that that's going to be more than up to task and uh, for our use we are going to be using this for endurance racing as well. So it's pretty important that it's going to be reliable. Now a, a part that I just showed you that I thought might just be worth talking about in a little bit more detail, probably not going to be able to see this too well on our overhead camera so instead let's just 
hopefully our iPhone camera is still working. Uh, this is a little uh, temperature sensor. Uh, we've sourced this locally from a company here called Motorsport Electronics uh, and they are made by Motorsport Electronics. You'll be able to find uh, similar products though I think from most Motorsport uh, wiring suppliers. So uh, there, there are a couple of advantages with this little sensor. It's a little stainless steel body. Uh, this one is threaded M6 by 1. There's also the option for an M4, uh, M8 I think, and also 1 8 MPT. So it covers most of your standard choices. As you can see, incredibly small profile which means it's easy to fit anywhere and you don't end up with a large connector coming out the back of it. It is sealed up with a heat shrink boot which is quite nice. 22 gauge wire covered in DR25 and as supplied it is just a flying lead. So the reason for this is depending on your application you could choose to terminate this as we have in a 2 pin DTM connector. Uh, if you want to get a little bit flash you could use an Autosport connector instead. Uh, so these particular sensors as well, uh, they are higher speed to the normal Bosch uh, fluid temperature sensors that we, we're normally using for the likes of uh, oil and water temperature and they also will read up to 200 degrees centigrade so nice little addition there that I thought I would share with you. Uh, giveaway time as well, uh, we I think have about 30 hours left to run on our JE Pistons giveaway so if you haven't entered in, into, into the draw yet please do so, the guys will drop a link into the comments that you can follow to get into that draw, uh, not long to go so please don't uh, muck around, there are, are a variety of other options when you actually enter the draw as well, uh, another bunch of activities that you can do to, to multiply the number of entries you'll get and that giveaway way is going to get you the chance to win a set of any of JE's shelf stock forge pistons so that covers just about any popular engine that uh, most people are modifying out there in the aftermarket. You'll get a set of their pistons, they'll be shipped to anywhere in the world so you don't have to be in the US. Uh, you'll also get our engine building starter package which is our engine building fundamentals course, uh, our uh, practical engine building course, our how to degree a cam course and you're going to get some gold membership as well giving you access to these regular weekly webinars and our members only forum. Uh, for those who are wondering after that that giveaway is finished uh, the one we will be starting next is going to be a Heltec Elite 950 it's going to come with one of Heltec's wideband units as well as their universal wire and harness so uh, we know for the, the uh, tuning guys out there this is going to be an, an incredibly popular giveaway so uh, we'll be bringing you some more details about that uh, shortly. Lastly just to finish off with we have just released another one of our videos from World Time Attack so we'll head across to my laptop for a moment. Uh, so one of the standouts at World Time Attack last year was the HKS TRB03 uh, which is loosely based on a Toyota 86. Uh, there's not a lot of information about this car. Uh, it's a bit controversial as well, it broke or claimed the Sukuba lap record with a 49 I think, actually can't quite remember now, uh, 49 second lap, however it did so controversially on a slick tyre where uh, the whole spirit of Time Attack has always been a dot legal tyre. Uh, so there's a bit of controversy as to whether or not that, that lap should stand as a record, however uh, it did do that time, slick tyres or not, went to Australia last year. Unfortunately it didn't really get a representative time uh, but we did manage to get as much detail together as we could uh, and we presented what we found in this video. So head across to our YouTube channel, make sure you check that video out and while you are there uh, make sure you subscribe as well, release new videos every week and there's some amazing content still to come out. Alright thanks for joining us there for our pre-show, give me a moment and we'll get started with our webinar.